Hi there, thank you for dropping by Hobbies, Crafts and Collectibles today. Today we're going on a play date with Sue Trimble from Robinson. She's got a great passion for doll collecting. You're gonna wanna see both her old and new dolls. Plus, we'll be talking with Dan Cruz from Marshall. He collects and customizes army men. You'll see what I'm talking about, stay with us. I'd like to welcome Sue Trimble from Robinson to our studio today. Sue, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. What a fun collection. I'm feeling like a kid again, surrounded by all these beautiful dolls. How long have you been collecting dolls? Since the early 70s I started. Okay. I uh, decided one day I was going to start collecting dolls. I put three dolls from my childhood in a glass cabinet and told my husband when he came home for lunch, I've started my doll collection. <laughs> and what was his reaction to that? It was okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll talk a little bit later about how, how much that collection has grown, but what was probably the first doll, let's say? You said it was from your childhood. What, what was the first one you just had to have? Well, I had to bring and start with Mary Hartline. Mary Hartline. She was on the Saturday morning circus. I think it was called the Super Circus. Mm. And um, she led uh, the band, and it was filmed in Chicago. And they used a Tony doll to make a likeness of, of um, Mary Hartline, sorry. That's okay, yeah. <laughs> they used a likeness of uh, Mary Hartline to make a Tony, use a Tony doll to make a likeness of her. And she um, was filming in Chicago. And um, later they decided to move the show to New York and she opted not to go and um, she married a millionaire and moved to Florida. Well, my goodness. She was quite a socialite <laughs> when she was, was finished. But it was one of the first dolls used in advertising that actually looked like the person she was representing. Oh, I see. That makes her special, I would assume. And these, these boots make her special in my book. Yes. Well, with the little friend. Those, those just look like drum major boots. <laughs> yes, they do. And that's what she did. She yeah. had a little drum major or baton and she led the um, band. She also came in um, a blue dress, a green dress, and a white dress. She came in two or three different sizes. Mm. And do her eyes um, open and close? Yes, they do. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. Now, I recognize the one standing next to her. As soon as I walked in this morning, I saw Shirley Temple, and it just made me smile. What year would she be from? Uh, she would have been during the Great Depression. Okay. And um, the movies came out with Shirley Temple, and... It, the people in the Depression at that time didn't have a lot of money, but they loved to go to the movies because mm -hmm. it sort of took them away from all their troubles. And along with Shirley Temple's mother, they decided to make a doll. And they actually did at least 28 prototypes before Mrs. Gertrude Temple agreed <laughs> to that doll. Oh my. And she has a little chubby tummy. Her legs are stocky and her calves are defined. And as I understand on the first prototypes, she actually had dimples in her derriere. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I love that. And I love that you so, know so much about your dolls. To me, the story just makes it even more <laughs> special. Now, what is she made of? Is she a composition? Yes, she is a composition. And she's in pretty good shape for a composition. You won't find Definitely. any crazy. Yes. That's amazing. And now this, this little sweetie, is she a composition She's also well? composition, yes. Okay, so which came first? Porcelain or composition dolls? Oh, porcelain did. All right. Composition came to replace it, thought they were a little more lifelike and not quite as breakable. I see. And what about the cute little guy in front? <laughs> he um, looks to be whistling. It's Whistling Jim. <laughs> um, and I'd been looking for a whistling doll for a few years. Um, and you could find the whistling dolls, but they didn't whistle anymore. Mm. And someone said, oh, it really didn't make any difference according to the value. But somehow in my mind, I wanted it to whistle. <laughs> and I found one a year ago. And... Yeah, I don't know whether we you can probably hear him. hear him. Yeah, we gotta hear him. Oh, that's great. Now, my husband says that's a, a squeak, <laughs> but he's a whistle to me. It's uh -huh. made by the Hubach, Hubach Doll Company. They made Whistling Jim, they made a Whistling Joe, and there are other companies that made them. There's a Whistling Willie that I, just comes to mind. But mm -hmm. uh, Oh, he's adorable. They got a little set of bellows in their stomach that you Push. Now I've seen a lot of um, older dolls with the sailor motif. Was that because of you think the wartime or? I think it was and it was just sort of a, a cute little time then and little, little children wore sailor outfits. I see. 
Now, in the box, you have, and I imagine that certainly affects its value, that you have the box and it's intact. And the box itself looks to me to be collectible. I love the graphics on the lid. But this is a doll that you can change. I didn't even know this existed. You can change the heads. Yes, you can. They sort of screw off like a can lid. <laughs> and you can put a different head on. And if you want to play Indians, well, you can just change the head. I or see. if you want to be mama or daddy or the baby, you just change the heads. Now we have um, the lid showing. I definitely want to get this propped up a little bit just so we can see some of the heads that were involved. Now they did come with clothes and I don't have any clothes. I've only seen one color picture of some clothes and the only one I could really make out was the clown costume. So I could make that. It was an orange and black. I see. But um, I'd like to see at least some colored pictures. Ideally I'd like to have the original clothes but uh, I think I'll probably end up having to make some. I see. <laughs> well, that is very well, cool. It came cool with that, more heads. Than well, that. I was going to say, it's amazing that you have all the heads that went with that one. Did that come all together? Or did you have to collect them? No, it came, I found Over, it all together. Okay, wonderful. Now, dolls have been around since who knows when, <laughs> but they're still making them today and some really beautiful ones. On the right here, we have a couple of, of older ones still. And uh, so I want to get to them first. And then I want to talk about some of the newer things that people are doing with doll making these days. This little beauty is a Bilo baby doll. A Bilo baby doll. Uh, came in various sizes. Uh, the Grace Story Putman is the one who made the Bilo baby doll. And she went to all of the hospitals in Los Angeles looking for the perfect baby so that she could sculpt the head. And as I understand, she sculpted it out of wax. She got mm. it sculpted, took it back to the hospital and actually laid it next to that newborn baby. It was three days old at the time. And uh, they said the hospital people could hardly tell which was the live head and which was the sculpted head. Wonderful. Now that was the first time that was ever done, that right? That was the first time that uh, supposedly that anyone had sculpted something to actually look like a baby according to a real life baby head. Wow. Well, she's pretty, does she have a name? No, just by, it's just, called a Bilo baby doll. You didn't name her, huh? No, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> that would be hard to keep track of all those yes. names. Now this one is so um, unique. I love the face on this. What is this made out of? Uh, it's made out of uh, some sort of a cloth um, and then they've painted over it. And it, they could be various cloths because everybody made their own doll any way that they wanted to, except they had to use the same pattern. And this was a, the Presbyterian ladies? Presbyterian ladies. And this was back in the 1800s, about the middle 1800s. They decided they needed to build a church and the Ladies Aid Society wanted to contribute to that church. And so they started making dolls. They sold them for a dollar a piece, hmm. later raised it to a dollar and a quarter. By the time they got finished, they did them four different times because they also started making dolls when they needed an organ for the church and then the organ needed repairs. And then the last time they were just some additions to the church they needed to make. They were all painted by the same lady from the first two. And the second two was uh, painted by a lady called uh, Mrs. Millard Tupps, T-U-P-P-S. And when they came to her to see if she would paint the dolls, they were gonna charge $3 for the dolls. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, Yes, I guess I'll paint them, but I don't know anybody who's going to pay $3 for a rag doll. <laughs> now, this is a 1960s version, This right? is a 1963. This was the third time that they, paint, they did the dolls. Okay. And yes, I know she's dressed as Amish, but there's a lot of Amish in Ohio. This was in Ohio is where this happened. Sure. They were not all dressed as, a, as Amish. They could stuff them with any way they wanted to, use any fabrics that they wanted to dress them with. I see. Now, um, here's some of the newer versions. This is a pretty famous doll maker today, and it's made out of, it's felted, right? Felted wool? Mm-hmm. That's a Maggie made doll by Maggie Iacona, and she's a well-known doll um, maker in this at this time. She just won a Lifetime Award, Achievement mm -hmm. Award, there in January. But she started sewing from when she was little, making her own clothes. Then she made her children's clothes. She made dolls for her children. Then she decided she wanted more detail in the head. Mm -hmm. And so she um, experimented with making a doll itself and then molding the felt mm -hmm. on top of the doll and then painting them. And uh, she oh. does a wonderful job. A lot oh, of her clothes so are made of felt and it's, it's just, they're beautiful dolls. Yeah, I love that one. And what about the one next to her? That's uh, from the Ruby Red Gallerina, and it's a factory-made doll, but she is a straw doll. She's the queen straw I well. just got her. <laughs> uh, 
I have a little shelf of dolls that are strawberry dolls because I grew up on a strawberry farm. So it, that appealed to me. I see. That, to add to my collection. Now I brought her because she is ball jointed. Um, this is the big thing right now in dolls. Mm. Her wrists move, her elbows move, her ankles move. There are some dolls even that, her to that their toes move. Wow. I read of one that had 21 points of articulation. Now mm -hmm. her wig can be removed and put a different color wig on her. And uh, some of them, even the face comes off and you can even get new eyes to put in them so that wow. you can interchange them completely. <laughs> They so come they're a doing long way, a, baby. They come a long way. That's right. <laughs> I'm screwing the head off, and <laughs> and then this last one over here. Um, what? What? Can you tell me about her? She looks um, Native American. She is uh, from the Alaska state of Alaska. Oh, okay. When I go someplace or travel, I like to get a doll and bring it back. But I prefer getting a doll made by someone who is a native of that country. I and see. And this doll is made by a lady named Alice Johnny, and she's a um, noted. Alaskan doll maker. She makes dolls to represent the clans in the southeast corner of Alaska. She uh, decorates them with the buttons. She uses the beads. They're all hand sewn and it represents, this one would be represent the Eagle Clan. Some might be the Bear Clan. They have different clans but... Uh, Beautiful. And I like them signed, and I always like to find out something about the lady that, or whoever made the dolls. Well, that's incredible. Now, Sue, I know you couldn't possibly have brought all of your collection with you today. How many do you think you've collected now? I have never counted entirely. <laughs> I have probably easy a thousand dolls on display. Wow. Now then I have some that are in other rooms and some are stored away. Now, what we're looking at right now on the screen, is that your home? Yes, that's the new room that we built a few years ago. Um, we doubled the size of the house. I didn't have to worry about what I put on the walls for pictures because they're all <laughs> glass lined shelves for dolls. Beautiful. Now you have um, grandkids? I have two grandsons. Oh, two grandsons. <laughs> what do they think of your doll collection? <laughs> uh, they, 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 don't, they put up with it. It's fine. And, and there was a time when they kind of liked a few of the dolls, but they've outgrown that now. Yeah, <laughs> I see. <laughs> Well, you have an amazing collection, and um, I just really appreciate I know some of these older ones can be a little fragile, so I really do appreciate you packing them up and bringing them down here. Um, would you suggest to any of the little girls out there, I know so much has become digital. We play on the computer, we play, you know, we watch the TV. What would you say to a little girl about dolls? I think everybody needs a doll or a teddy bear or something to love, to hold on to. Um, and they may say, well, I don't like dolls and they don't maybe want the frilly doll, but maybe they want dolls that come with horses or come with dogs. Or maybe they want like the G.I. Joe, who is an army man. So I think you can find a doll to fit just about any situation. I see. Sounds wonderful. Well, thank you so much. You kind of brought me back to my childhood. And we really appreciate you bringing your collection in to show us, Sue. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it. It is my pleasure to welcome Dan Cruz from Marshall to the studio today. Dan, thank you for coming. Jessica, I'm glad to be here. Oh, well, this is fun. We had a, um, a doll collector earlier, and so now I, I hate to call these boy dolls. I think they're more like action figures, right? Well, they're, they're, toy, <laughs> they're toy soldiers, and um, they, they go directly back to my lost youth. And um, what was really fun was that when I was growing up, and I was a little boy of the 1960s, I, I loved toy soldiers. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I grew up and became a teen, I put them away because teenagers aren't supposed to play with toy soldiers, but um, I, uh, I went to college and got married and had children, and then when my sons were about four or five years old, I pulled out my toys, and I thought, I love those toys, <laughs> and um, rediscovered toy soldiers, and um, found out that, you know, I really liked, I, I liked it, and I found out that there's still a, a big collect, uh, collectors out there who, mm -hmm. uh, who grew up at the same time I did and kind of still fell in love with their toys as soldiers, and I found out that, hey, you know, um, they're still out there, and here I am, 51 years of age, and <laughs> I'm, I'm back playing with toy soldiers. So playing with your boys, a hobby yes. was born. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, you know, you, they always say you'd put some toys away. Well, I put it away, but not very far. Gotcha. You know, I pulled them back out. <laughs> Well, this is fun because it is, it's kind of, I hate to say, but it is a conglomeration of hobby craft and collectible. Right. <laughs> because you've got your hobby, obviously, collecting 
obviously. And then it's a craft because you actually hand paint a lot yeah, of these soldiers. I do. In fact, um, when when I was a uh, when I was a, a kid, mm -hmm. you know, and you had the toy soldiers, and you're playing on the living room floor and with them. And then as I uh, I got older, I found out that there were not just American kids who were playing with toy soldiers, but kids from England and kids from China and, and different manufacturers, um, you know, made toy soldiers that covered all eras. And so that was, it was kind of a, an education uh, mm -hmm. for me to discover that there's a lot of toy soldiers around the world. And so, um, you know, I was used to a, a brand of toy soldiers called the Marks Toy Soldier Company. I see. And they made, uh, they were very popular in the 1960s. They made the famous uh, Fort Apache, which was basically a cowboy and Indian set mm -hmm. and then they made the blue and the gray which was a civil war set and then they made a set called battleground which was they had two uh, series of battleground you had your pacific theater with the um, uh, american troops versus the japanese troops and then you had your european theater which was the american troops versus the the germans mm -hmm. well um you know i had all all three of those sets and periods and i uh discovered that there was romans and there was revolutionary war and wow. then there, and so you know no matter what era that uh uh, you were interested in there was toy soldiers that you know um, that reflected that your interest well mm -hmm. I started kind of thinking about, okay, now how long have toy soldiers been around? And I kind of did just a little bit of research and found out that there's evidence that there are toy soldiers, or I should say miniatures, that go back to ancient Egypt. But probably the popular um, toy soldiers that we would know today really started in the early um, 1800s by a company uh, out of England called Britons. And Britain toys are very collectible today. They're still made today. Those and, have been lead? Well, they've been lead. And um, uh, as they, as we kind of went into the early part of this, uh, the last century, I would say in the 1920s and 30s, they became like a hard plastic. Mm -hmm. Then following World War II, they became rubber and there was a certain amount of lead that was in those toys, which is now outlawed. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, what, what I found interesting was that the, the toys that I was really familiar with as a kid, um, those, like say, here's a, a little toy from the, um, the Fort Apache set, and it's kind of an early pioneer. And what, what makes this really kind of fascinating is the fact that today, you know, you could lose this toy back in the 1960s and lose it outside and it could be buried in the dirt and dig it up 20 years later it's still going to be pretty good mm -hmm. okay but today since there's no lead content in these toys if you were to have if you were to recreate this um, toy by today's standards and left it outside what would happen it was a deg it would degrade and there'd be nothing left sure. so i never thought of that well a lot of the toys they really um uh, you'll find them in auctions and you'll find them in, in in shows probably one of the largest toy soldier shows happens right here in illinois in chicago mm. and it's called the uh, um the chicago toy soldier show and we're talking people from all around the globe um show up in um, Chicago the fourth weekend in September every year and they've just celebrated 30 years of um, people coming from all over the world to share and sell their toys. Wow well I find it fascinating like you said you've got different eras but you also have brought to kind of display how toys have changed through the years. Sure. Um, these would be examples of 1960s That's tanks, correct right, right right those were Lewis Marks tanks mm -hmm. uh, that came in the play set and they were very generic they were you know you know this is a German uh, tank because of the German symbol up here and and it looks very close but not very uh, detailed of what uh, a tiger or panther tank would look like. Mm -hmm. Well, you uh, let's go uh, to today's tanks that are manufactured, and this is a Forces of Valor tank. And if you were to go into a museum today that had uh, real tanks, this tank would look exactly, you know, everything down to the rivets and the bolts. And you can tell this one looks like it's been a little bit weathered. And, um, you know, it's just so detailed. And that's one of the interests why... Um, I got interested in this again because uh, I guess I'm still a, a little boy at heart and I like to play <laughs> army, you know, and, sure. and, and so uh, I was always kind of really fascinated by uh, how cool the toys look today. And it's not that I'm turning my back on my lost youth with these old toys, <laughs> but I'm thinking, oh, that is so cool. And, and so anyway, when I, uh, when I rediscovered the toys, I thought, you know, I just don't want to play with them on the floor. I want to make something, um, make sense out of it. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing diorama. Uh -huh. And um, I've got a, a six foot by six foot diorama in my basement of a complete Normandy battle scene, you know, World War II um, battle between the German soldiers and American paratroopers. And um, I add to it every year. Um, it's not something I do every day. 
-hmm. but I walk past it at least four or five times a week and I think, oh, let's see, what can we do to tweak it and make this a little bit more real? And so uh, it's, that's kind of my hobby. I love that. And I, now I want to pick up one of the examples. Is this sure. something you've painted? That is. That is, um, uh, that's three figures from the Lewis Marks uh, Battleground um, uh, play set from the 1960s. And what I did is just that um, I washed those soldiers. I had to make sure I got all the oil off of the soldiers. And then uh, once, I let them, once I let them dry, I painted them. And I tried to make them as realistic with, um, you know, uh, try to make it look as real as possible and I tried to age them by giving them dirty shirts and you know because you know there's not a you know on the battlefield you don't find pristine soldiers out there you find soldiers that are grimy and dirty and sure. they've been busy you know they haven't had time to take a shower and I wanted to make <laughs> those uh, and wash their clothes and I wanted to make those soldiers look like that. Maybe I should smell them is there, yeah, is yeah, there yeah. like smell? Yes I do I, I make them smell so that they smell really realistic. <laughs> well um, it's interesting because there are different materials even today I know you brought a couple of examples of ones that you've purchased that are mm -hmm. pewter and these have been hand painted we'll let the yes the camera come in and pick that up but fascinating um those if, are nice and heavy if you look at them you'll even see facial you know the facial features are, are very prominent mm -hmm. um the the german soldier who is being taken prisoner right here uh, what's interesting about that is that he's wearing uh, you know that uniform is probably as authentic as a real uniform would look. Uh, he's got camouflage pants on. Um, he's got a, a cuff title on his uniform. And uh, you can look at the creases between his fingers. And you know that I'm telling you, there's some outstanding painters out there. And they have been my um, inspiration when I go mm. to paint my soldiers. Is like, hey, can I paint to that scale? And I, I heard you mention earlier when we were setting them out that you like flags. Oh, I love and flags. You've, you've got a few examples. Could you describe maybe what sure. we're seeing? Well, uh, I brought uh, two examples of a, uh, a Stars and Bars Confederate flag from the Civil War era. And you'll see that this was a kind of a, a work in progress because um, I think this flag right here is more authentic of the way the flags look. Where here, this was a mistake because it's not the true colors, but I thought mm. I would keep it because uh, a lot of the flags were handmade during the Civil War. Therefore, you know, there wasn't a, 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 a kind of a continuity between all the flags. Sure. Um, here is an example of a Japanese uh, flag that I made from a bonsai attack uh, for a Pacific scene that I'm, I'm creating at my house. And then I have, um, this is a, a, a current uh, toy here that, um, as you can, this is from the Conte Company out of uh, Georgia, oh. and you can see that that is so detailed, and that's oh, going to take a little bit to paint. <laughs> yeah. But, um, it, it, you know, you see everything from the stars to the um, uh, the rank uh, on the sleeve of the soldier, and you can see where there would be braid on his arms, and so. Look at the back. You even got you got the tassels in the flag. Yeah. And, I don't know if you can see the there. You yeah. can see the holes. There's a little battle. It's <laughs> yeah, battle damaged. Battle. Yeah. Bullet wounds there. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's gonna be a fun one. It's gonna be a fun one. In fact, uh, that's uh, that is on the assembly line for me to paint here with him. <laughs> Uh, the paint shortly. So some of the tools of the trade that you would need if you were going to get into this hobby, um, I mean I'm sure you can, what, that's one of the things I love about hobbies, but especially this one that it, you can get into it as much as you want. You can sure. have a six foot diorama in your basement or you can just have a, a small collection of soldiers and you've got, well I for me it's, the, what are the exacto knives for? Well sometimes you <laughs> have like uh, when some of the uh, soldiers came out of the um, uh, the moles, mm -hmm. there were little sprues that were left on there and I try to trim those up and sometimes yeah. excess plastic through the, the through the process of uh, coming out of the mold injection sure, process, the seams are there's such. just a, sometimes like what they call flashing and a good exacto knife will kind of shave that down. Uh, for me it's been a continual work in progress of trying to find out what is the right kind of paint and what's the right tools to use. Mm -hmm. I've, uh, it's kind of embarrassing but I've spent as much as twenty dollars for a paintbrush and I've had just as much success with a $2 paintbrush, you mm -hmm. know. But um, I, I probably have a, I probably could have my own collection of paintbrushes because this is just a small amount that I, I brought of the various um, kind of brushes that I use. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I have, um, I have purchased dental equipment um, that, you know, kind of picks that I can get in and kind of detail some of the things too. So, I mean, you know, um, the sky's the limit. And um, it's always, for me, it's, a, it's um, I steal people's ideas. I talk with other painters and mm -hmm. I thought, hey, you know, that's a good idea. And um, I kind of steal their ideas and, um, and the way that they, um, you know, do, do the hobby. I mm -hmm. Usually what I do is I paint 
uh, four to five soldiers at one time, mm -hmm. and I do it in layers, you know. And uh, sometimes I'll do a, kind of a, a protective coat that'll keep the paint on, because if you don't, the paint will flake off. And so I have had to learn that the hard way. Sure, yeah. I can imagine. Now, this is, we're gonna wrap up, but this is, um, kind of a great hobby to grow into for young boys. And I, what I love about it is the history of it. Yeah, yeah. What a great way to learn history and just slowly grow a collection. Um, I just think it's wonderful. Thank you so much for- Oh, well, thanks for having me. And thanks for letting me in. share my little passion with you. Absolutely, it's just great. Thank you again for joining us for Hobbies, Crafts, and Collectibles this week. I hope you had as much fun as I did. If you know someone who has a special interest and we should talk to them, please contact us. We'd love to hear from you. See you next time.